Hi everybody, my name is Marta Mama, I'm your basic queer bitch, and I'm here to explain you all the references about Drag Race España Season 3. Una bruja buena o una bruja mala? Una bruja mala. <laughs> so before we start, I want to give a shout out to the people that sent me PayPal this week. Thank you so much, you guys. This channel wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you, Emma, Marion, Thomas, and Dylan. Love you. If you want to support my channel, you have my PayPal account down below. Let's get into it. So I must say that, as you know, I wasn't very happy with the first two episodes of this season, but the people from Drag Race said, Marta, give it a chance. Just wait a little bit. It's going to get better. Just wait. And they were right. I loved this episode. One of my favorite episodes ever and probably my favorite acting challenge ever. I love the challenge, I love the writing, I love the editing, and I love the runway. So 10 out of 10 for me, you guys. So there's not exactly a mini challenge this week. They do this thing like popping balloons with the pit crew uh, to determine the teams for the acting challenge. As you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the like sex jokes and all that. Like I'm not a prude. I'm okay with like sexual jokes and references completely fine. But if you're going to make a sexual joke, just make it funny. Shout out to my girls, Pitita and Paquita, because they refuse to make this into something sexual. Uh, Paquita doesn't like at all like the sexual thing with the pit crew. She doesn't get it. She doesn't understand it. She just grabs a balloon and says, bite this. And that's basically it. So they get into three teams and they discover that they're going to be acting in adaptations of Spanish horror movies. And so we have three teams. The first team is going to be El Guarranato. And they are Vania Vainilla, Pinchadora, Kelly Roller, and Ornella Gongora. This is a version of the Spanish movie El Orfanato. Second group is going to do a version of Rec called Drag Rec. And they are Pitita, Paquita, and Bestia. And they were the top three last week. And the third group is, are going to do a version of The Others. And they called it Las Otras. And that group was La Macarena, Cloverfish, and Visa. So before we go into it, there are a lot of very cool conversations in the workroom getting ready. First, they talk about how dangerous it is just to walk down the street being a woman or a feminine person, that you can feel the danger when you're dressed up as a woman. Shout out to Clover Bish that said the best sentence in the whole episode is, you know, that the LGBTQIA community is not only the G for the gays, you know. Lesbians exist, bisexuals exist, trans people exist, intersexual people exist. Like there are a lot of queer experiences in general, but it's sometimes only like for the gay men. And when you're not a gay man in this community, it's easy to feel, you know, like you don't belong sometimes. And it's not true, we do belong. So super nice conversations and then Visa and Pitita have a very heartfelt conversation where Visa tells the story of her father. Her father very sadly passed away in this huge explosion in her home and I was, I was bawling my eyes out. And she had a very difficult relationship to reconcile with all of this because he was very abusive towards her mom. So when you lose a parent who was very abusive and everyone comes and pours a lot of love into you who you have just lost your father and of course you're not happy that he died but your mom is not being abused anymore and all of this is very difficult psychologically. So before we get into the runway, Let's talk a little bit about the maxi challenge. Let's go movie by movie. Let's go group by group. And let me explain you a couple of the references that you may not be getting. First of all, this is probably my favorite acting challenge of any of the seasons of any of the franchises of Drag Race. 
I think that, of course, we we have the normal problems that we will have anywhere. But if you compare it with the acting challenges of season one, Física o Química, that thing, and from season two, El Diario de Putricia, well, this one was amazing. It gave the opportunity to have like full stories with the middle, a problem and an ending. You did understand what was going on. You could understand each of the characters. Each one had time to shine. I really like how they edited it. And I like the challenge in general. Acting challenges are usually super, super, super messy. But these ones, like they all started somewhere, they ended somewhere and they were easy to follow and they were funny as well. So very well done. So a couple of references about El Guarranato. El Guarranato is a play on words with the original name of the movie, El Orfanato, the orphanage. Uh, this movie is about a lady that goes back to live in the orphanage where she grew up with her son and his son suddenly disappears and you know there's a lot of children that died in that orphanage you can get like a little what's going on so that lady was supposed to be kelly roller and a couple things so the two girls vania and pinchadora were supposed to be ghosts i don't know if everybody understood that i guess they did and uh, kelly roller's character was called patty coja like the limping leg lady. That's why she was wearing roller skates on one foot and high heels on the other foot. She was limping because her name was like lame, like limping person. And the other one is Ornella's character was called Juana y Medium. Uh, and she had a mustache. Uh, medium is of course a medium, like a psychic. Uh, and Juan y Medio is an excellent, very epic, iconic TV host. And he's known for many things, but for many years he has had a dating show on TV for older people here in Andalucía. And I think that's beautiful and epic. And it gives so many memes and iconic moments with all these old ladies and old men trying to date. Super cute. He's a staple on Spanish television. So this character was Juana y Medium, and it was a mix between a psychic and Juana y Medio. I thought that she was going to be on the top this week. I think she did an amazing, amazing job. Everyone acted super well here. I have, no, I don't have a lot of issues because I think you you could literally like understand the story pretty well. The second film was Drag Rec, and that was Pitita Paquita and Bestia. That's an adaptation, a parody of Rec. Uh, Rec is a series of four films, Rec, Rec 2, Rec 3, Rec 4. Uh, and the director was this week's host, Paco Plata. They are zombie movies, and I've only seen the first one, but well, uh, I think it's like a couple of journalists, like a cameraman and like a TV reporter and they go to this building for some type of news and then they seal the building because there's like this virus outbreak. So it's a zombie apocalypse theme. So you are trapped inside of a building where this outbreak, zombie outbreak is happening and it's filmed like in a mockumentary, like a false documentary style. So super cool movie, I love zombies. You have the cameraman, the reporter, and Paquita doing like the zombie person. This was hilarious. My only note here is that you couldn't really understand what Bestia was saying and she admitted it on social media. I think that Pitita did well, but I absolutely loved Paquita's physical comedy. As you know, I'm always going to be biased with Paquita and Paquita will always be my favorite. But I love her. She can be like so stupid and so funny and everything she does, she does wonderful. So 10 out of 10. And Las Otras is a parody of the movie The Others. This is a movie by Alejandra Menavar. And the main character is actually Nicole Kidman. If you haven't seen this movie, you have to. Like stop whatever you're doing. If you like horror films, go and watch this movie because it's 
one of my favorites. You have three characters, the young girl who has a sensitivity to light, her mother, and a nanny. And the twist is that the nanny, instead of being the one from the film, is actually Mary Pompis instead of Mary Poppins. Pompis in Spanish is like the butt. Um, thank you very much for not saying Mary Poppins. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you, writers, very much. So this I was doing the mother, the Nicole Kidman character. Uh, Clover was being the little girl. And Macarena was being Mary Pompis, who was in the wrong movie, basically. And it was super funny because in a certain point in the sketch, she starts playing music and it's like the singing challenge from season one. Castilla La Mancha. And that makes the corpse uh, like come back to life and they all start dancing and it's like a whole thing. But I could understand the story. Like usually I never understand what's going on in any of the acting challenges. And this one, like, I understood what was going on. The judges said that they weren't, like, super fans of Bisa and Clover's delivery. I think the rhythm was off sometimes, but other than that, I think no one did a bad job in this acting challenge. So, this is editing Marta from the future. I forgot to talk about Maria Adilia in the challenge. Uh, she was playing this person... Uh, this is Sayuna Pringada, uh, she's a YouTuber, and she is always in a lot of controversy. So instead of bringing the YouTuber, they brought Maradilia dressed up as Sayuna Pringada, which was super funny. Okay, let's go to the runway. Category is Mi Peor Yo, My Worst Self. And here you're supposed to explore your deepest fears, maybe some of your trauma, the worst part about yourself, something like that. And even though I love explaining you guys all of the references, I love these categories. I do not like the ones that is, oh, you have to recreate a Eurovision look. That is so limited to a person's creativity and for drag, that is very limited. But these type of categories, let you explore things, let you explain who you are as a person and as a drag artist, let you be vulnerable and let you show a lot of different things. I don't think it's necessarily like uh, terror based. This is the category for me, a little bit more about vulnerability and concept and creation of a look and how you transmit a message. So I love these categories. I think it worked wonderfully, but there's not a lot for me to explain. But let's go one by one. Bania Vanilla is afraid of spiders, so she did this look. There's nothing to explain other than I couldn't really see the looks with the lightings on the runway. There's a huge problem with the lightings. And, you know, it was like a blue or purple lighting and I couldn't really see anything that she was wearing. But yeah, that was her inspiration. It was a little bit like, okay. Kelly Roller's look I thought was terrible. I, I'm i starting to respect Kelly Roller more and more and more. I think that she went to Drag Race with a mission, with a mission that may not be winning, but yeah, she did this Kim Kardashian inspired thing that is supposed to reflect the time that she suffered from depression and then she revealed into a beautiful version of Kelly. There are so many wrong things with this look. First of all, them hips don't match them shoulders. If you're going to put like big shoulder pads thing on the outside of your shoulders and not have any padding it gives a very weird silhouette the silhouette was wrong everywhere in so many levels the chaps that she were wearing chop like everything i did not like anything whatsoever but well this is what she presented i was very moved with ornella's gongora's look she is representing like the 
Silence Equal Death, talking about HIV. Uh, I thought it was a very powerful, vulnerable, important message to give on the runway. And there's not a lot to say about it. I thought it was very powerful. And I feel stupid giving critiques and such a powerful message, you know? If I had to give any critiques, I would have made it somehow a little more literal. We have just seen like Cheddar Gorgeous do the pink triangle look, which I think reflects this in a better way. But of course that's been done and it's not fair to compare drag queens. But sometimes it's something like that. Like we knew what it was and that she was talking about silence and the color red was present. Like we could interpret what it's about. But until she turned around and you could see the writing on her back, it wasn't really that clear. And I think it's such a powerful message and the look was so beautiful that maybe it was missing something, maybe the color, like, I don't know, something that would make it a little more obvious. But I feel really stupid giving critiques on such a powerful look anyway, you know? Being tattooed as look was interesting. I love how vulnerable she was talking about how much it affects her, the fact that she is gay and that she knows that it's going to be hard for her if she wants to create a family someday. And the shared trauma that a lot of people in the LGBT community have with that. Um, I thought it was a very powerful message again. And I thought it was very honest from her and vulnerable from her. I had a couple issues, all these little baby parts, I really like the idea, but I do not like that they're coming from a different fabric. I would have glued them straight to the body. I don't understand why you need like a different color fabric where all the body parts are sticked, are glued up on. I would have done it like straight to the flesh. I think it's a lot more powerful. Or if you want to wear a beautiful gown, that's great. Do it on the same gown, on the same fabric at least. Because if not, it looks like a bib, like a separate part of the outfit. But again, I feel stupid giving like um, fashion critiques with such vulnerable moments and interesting points. So instead of all of that, I'm gonna try to translate you guys a poem that Pinchadora's husband wrote and this is the like the description of the look that she has used in almost all of her social media. This would be an improvised poem translation but I just thought it was beautiful and it says something like this. If my mom knew that her son wanted to be a mother, she would take the first flight to Spain. She would shrink her legs. She would amputate her arms. She would break her back. She would eat one by one all of her teeth and all of her 60 years. She would become smaller and smaller. She would invent a whole language and she would babble again just to be my daughter. And I thought it was beautiful. So even though there's a couple like fashion things I would have done different with the look, like who cares, you know, this is true drag, this is true art and vulnerable feelings and it's not only about fashion. Macarena's look was amazing. I was so happy for her because she did amazing as Mary Pompis. Like, oh my God. And then she comes out with this look, recreating the look she went home in season one with the big like flamenco rubber ducky thingy. I was so excited for her. We were all screaming. She looked amazing. Uh, the bold wig cap with a hundred little hairpins, like all the little details. This was a great week for Macarena. It's the first time that she is on top and she has the judges saying nice things to her. So I'm super happy for her. Great episode. Clover Bish look was this. It represented like all the hardships that uh, people of color have to go through with the Afro hair. And even though I understand that this is about like the hardships and the stigma and all that, I don't really understand how it fits into the category. I love the look, but I don't understand if it's like a true 
vulnerable worst part of yourself and the things you have problems with I would have taken to a slightly more vulnerable personal route somehow after a lot of these messages it felt a tiny bit empty to be honest and I love her and I love her drag but I was expecting something powerful in the vulnerability and of course like afro hair and all the stigma that comes with it is an important topic I just don't think it's vulnerable enough and it doesn't let me know Clover to a deeper level um but the look is very correct and she looked amazing to be honest because per, for example then Visa comes out and I'm still crying from yesterday. I thought this was so powerful. Like there were so many things that we can say to a fashion sense about the look, which are completely worthless. And there's no merit in anything that I can say about this look because it was such a powerful, impactful moment. Like I still have goosebumps every time I think about it. This is true vulnerability this is when you're acting but you don't have to exaggerate when you this is drag for me this is really what drag means for me so I'm gonna cry again why is it that I cry in every single episode like I was so emotional with this and the difficult story about her father being abusive but then losing him and and all of these hardships, like, I thought this was amazing. And there's no fashion critique that would make this any bit worse. That it is just perfect the way it is, you know. So congratulations to Visa. I, I am just so in love. Vidita comes out with this, like, cigarette look and makeup and all this. Uh, she said on social media that this was an homage to... Uh, her boss of many years because she they would always go together to have like a smoke break a cigarette break and she just passed away so yeah I like this look I'm not wowed by this look to be honest I also think that it's a little bit um simple in the vulnerable personal side of it I don't know maybe it's the type of drag I'm attracted to this is gorgeous, like the silhouette is amazing, the finishes are amazing. She combines like red and gray and black rhinestones up top to make it look like the cigarette is lit and the hairpiece and everything works wonderfully. But sometimes for certain runways and especially just after what we just saw, again, it felt a tiny bit empty. But after we said like honestly, anything would feel like a little bit empty. And then Bestia comes out with this look about like the voices in her head. It was okay, there's not a lot to talk about it. The whole character that Bestia is, is supposed to be like the bad voices in your head telling you like you're not worthy, like the imposter syndrome and all these things. And she is supposed to be the little head that is on the other side of the tongue. Uh, I like Club Kid style very, very, very much, but I this is not my favorite look from Bestia, and I think she could have developed this concept maybe in a different way, but um, it was valid, it was understood, uh, she looked good, just not uh, spectacular for me. <laughs> and Paquita's runway, you know, I'm always going to be biased with Paquita, but I really, really, really like this because if you know Paquita, you know that she's obsessed with her long hair and it's like a symbol for her of her many things like her identity, her gender, her beauty, her youth and the symbol of her losing her hair, the symbol of her losing many, many things. And I know that through moments of hardship, she had a problem where she started like losing quite a bit of hair and she started panicking because her hair symbolizes a lot of things for her so this losing the beauty and losing the perfectness but still looking amazing it is like I always have this thing with Paquita's runways that she tells a full complete story that everyone can get and that she doesn't have to explain anything or put big words anywhere 
and we all understand what she's talking about. So this is probably Paquita's deepest fears, losing her hair, losing her beauty, losing her identity, losing the perfect looks that she is all the time. And I think it was pretty therapeutic treating it like a runway and still looking beautiful. Like I can still look beautiful through my worst nightmare, you know? So of course, you know, I'm always biased with Paquita, but I think this, this week was so good for her. So we get to know the tops and the bottoms. In the tops we have Macarena, finally, Pitita and Paquita. Uh, and the winner this week is Pitita. Pitita did a very good job. And my opinion about who should have won or who should have been in the top, I think is not important. That we don't watch Drag Race because we're expecting the most objective results every single week. That's not why we like Drag Race, but I thought it was between personally Paquita and Macarena. I think Macarena did amazing. And I think Ornella should have been on top, to be honest. But everyone is falling in love with Pitita and I'm falling in love with Pitita like everybody else. So congratulations to her. My question is, uh, this thing that Paquita is always on top and never wins, why is that? Is there a reason for that? Is Paquita going to win any week? Because of course I always say, and I told her this yesterday, uh, you want to it's you want to deserve it. It doesn't matter if you win it or not, but you want to deserve winning. Like once you get that, it's like you won, but she was like, yeah, but the 2,500 bucks would be very useful. And I'm like, I completely understand. And then in the bottom, we have Kelly Roller, Clover, and Bisa. I think Bisa was probably saved for her runway, which I think is completely appropriate. And then we have Kelly and Clover. None of them did bad in the acting challenge. Clover's look was pretty good. Like, I don't think that it was her look that put her there. Kelly Roller did pretty well in the acting challenge, in fact. But that look was like very, very, very harsh. and. So that was their lip sync. The song that they lip sync to is called Ay Mama by Rigoberta Bandini. And this was the second option to go to Eurovision. We finally took a uh, slow-mo from the other week. And it's about the empowerment of women and about mothers and about the bodies of cis women. And of course, this lip sync was going to be to Clover. You know how all this works. This was aired on Mother's Day in Spain, and next week is actually Eurovision. So if that wasn't on purpose, it was perfect timing. Clover won. I did not enjoy this lip sync whatsoever. I love Clover as an artist, and I love Kelly as an artist, weirdly. Um, I do think that this lip sync is not mm, kakara, kaka, kak. This is a heartfelt, powerful lip sync, in my opinion. And it's not about just showing your boob. It's about heartfelt things and empowerment. And I think that sometimes performing too much a song makes it lose a little bit of its meaning. Uh, I don't know, I'm not a better lip syncer than Clover to say all this, but just my opinion. In the end, she showed her boobies and she had like a kind of a trans flag and it said for my sisters. That's very important for, Clo for Clover that everyone understands that she is representing for the women, for all the women, for the trans women and the cis women. She is a cis woman, but she will always be in the team women. And that the fact that she is a cis person in this experience doesn't want to invalidate any trans person in this experience. So she will always, always, always have a message about trans inclusivity. In fact, she just dropped merch about trans inclusivity and like benefits for that will go to like a trans youth association or something like that. So I love the message. I just would have loved all of this delivered in a different way. Kelly Roller goes home. Um, I've been very critic of Kelly Roller. Uh, as you know, I'm just not excited for her drag. But to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of in peace with her. 
I think that she came with the idea of making the most of this experience in the sense that now she's going to make a lot more money. She's one of the hardest working drag queens in Spain and she probably didn't want to spend a whole ton of money and then be sent home like in the first week. So her runways have never been something amazing whatsoever, but I didn't, I don't think that she went there to show fashion at all. Like she is probably the person that spends less money from the whole cast. And she just, she is just there to make money, to get those coins and to still working as much as she has always been working. Maybe she's not the type of drag that I'm most excited about. But I truly, I truly consider her like a punk camp bitch right now. So you do you. If I went to Drag Race ever, I would do the same thing. Like not spend any money. Just like do whatever and take the critiques. And then, you know, live my life. So before we finish, I would like you to write me in the comments uh, who are your favorites right now. So let me know in the comments. Again, if you're not listening to Expose, the podcast, you're losing like a lot of information. It is super fun. Joseph Shepard and I have a lot of fun every single week. If you're not listening to that, you have to because I'm kind of like a little bit too sassy sometimes. So go listen to that. Shout out to Maddie Rants and all the Rant Pack and everyone that came here through Maddie. Uh, love you guys. I'm very glad that we're discovering Drag Race España together. If you want to help me continue with this channel, you have my PayPal account down below. You can follow me on social media. You can leave reviews and questions for the podcast. I really hope that all of you are like still watching Drag Race España and you haven't given up yet because it's uh, kind of amazing now. So that will be all for today. I want to hear what you guys think, okay? Okay? So that's all for today. See you next week. I love you all. Stay queer. I love you.